This video has been carefully designed to hopefully stop you making a mistake and regretting your decision on the purchase of a brand new iPhone 14 Pro or Pro Max. My name is Adam and I'm here to drop some truths. But first, let's set the scene and thanks to Pataka for sponsoring today's video. Right, so you're curious about switching to an iPhone 14 Pro or Pro Max from an iPhone 13 series or older or an Android phone. You've heard about all the new features and you've just either bought one and want some reassurance that you made the right decision or you have one on order or you're just about to pull the trigger on that order. And you wanna know whether those new features are indeed worth the upgrade. Well, to that vein, I have two brand new 14 Pro Maxes here, one in the brand new deep purple color and one in gold, which I've been using roughly for around a week now. And I wanted to wait on this full review because I wanted to give it some time. I wanted to fully test all those brand new features and tell you whether Apple's brand new flagship actually lives up to all of that hype. Not just firing out a quick unboxing or a rundown of the specs and features we already know. And spoiler alert, it's not black and white. And my opinions are very split on a lot of areas. Let's dive. Right, so firstly, this segment right here is actually being shot in the new updated cinematic mode. You can now shoot up to 4K at 30 frames per second or 24 frames per second. Fight out amongst yourselves which you think is the correct or best frame rate. But that aside, we know Apple have done some industry leading work in video in recent years and it stays true again with the iPhone 14 series. Not only in standard video with visuals and impressive audio, but I also think they've done an incredible job with this new tweaked cinematic mode. Edge detection in most cases is pretty strong, especially with regards to people, considering you have that moving focal point and it's software based, that bokeh, the background blur, but the stabilization also is on another planet. It just makes that footage look so much more professional. I can see a lot of people finding this really useful, especially those looking to shoot their own YouTube videos, TikToks, etc. Especially those who don't want to shell out thousands of pounds on a new camera system, DSLR, etc. I even like how when the phone doesn't quite nail the focus, foreground to background, the transition to then finding it, it doesn't feel rushed or jumpy like most other phones when video recording. Really velvety smooth. And while we're here, I'd like to introduce to you, for the first time on the channel, a new member to the ASBYT family. We still love and really miss Dottie, but we have a new family member and she's called Bonnie. And she says hi. Now sticking with camera for a second, while the massively more pro statement from Apple might be considered a little bit of an exaggeration, I don't think the fact we haven't seen multiple huge changes this time around is necessarily a bad thing. It's a refinement to an already great camera system with tweaked hardware. The much talked about new 48 megapixel main sensor now offers you great flexibility in most people's everyday use. And in lower lighting conditions, the new sensor groups every four of its 48 megapixels together, technically making them 12 larger ones to allow in more light. As long as all your other settings are on point, usually the more light a camera sensor gets, the better the image quality can be. And a 48 megapixel shot versus the default 12 megapixel shot should be, in theory, better by giving you greater sharpness and detail. The funny thing is, I mentioned the default 12 megapixels because most people will buy the phone thinking they're using the 48 megapixel sensor, but in fact they're not. You have to actually manually change that in the settings to allow the Pro Raw option. Now, if you're wondering, here are a few 48 megapixel shots compared to the 12 megapixel ones on the iPhone 13 Pro Max. Can you tell the difference? For me, most people probably won't at first look, especially those images that are then shared on social media, which naturally compresses the image anyway. But there is a difference, especially if you're going to crop in on an image or blow it up in post. The details are just simply stronger. The new action mode is impressive again. There is a slight crop and a little noise, but it's far more stable and there's not too much of a hit on footage quality, something that no other smartphone can claim. Now, thanks to Apple's new Photonic engine, HDR is excellent, but the engine also helps to correctly interpret sharpness, detail, motion blur, color, and more. Although I would argue that color temperature on an iPhone's camera is still a bit off by default. I've said it for many generations and I will continue to say it with the 14 series, they're just too warm. People talk about the color science being great on an iPhone, I just don't see it. 
way too orangey red, especially in skin tones, and it just makes me actually have to go into the settings and change it to a cooler shade. And that is great that you can do that. You can go in and adapt and customize the images that you want to see, whether that be more saturation, more contrast, cooler, warmer, etc. That is great. But again, for the average consumer, they're probably not going to know that the ability to do that is there. Look how red it is now. That is tomato. That is absolute tomato. Look at the state of that. You could of course argue color is subjective, so we won't go into too much detail on that, but objectively, they still have a problem with lens flare as well. And I, again, I don't really see that on pretty much any other smartphone. I don't understand why they have a problem with this. When shooting into direct sunlight, often great HDR capabilities, but also lens flare. Hopefully, they can alter this in the 15 series. Now, I didn't notice a huge difference on the ultra wide lens image quality, considering they say it's apparently three times better, but it's still very competitive. And portrait mode is now one of the best I've tested on any phone if the subject is stationary. If there's movement, it's still, in my experience, can struggle. Broken record here, the iPhone, like every other Android phone currently right now, still is not as competent as the Pixel phones at this. Moving portrait shots are just something else, magical on a Pixel. So with any kind of movement, whether that be people or pets, as the Pixel shutter lag is next to nothing because it does a lot of its post-processing to make the image look so good, nothing else currently seems to be able to compete. So it's not even as efficient as the last generation of the Pixel phones, the 6 Pro in this case. Stay tuned for a seven uh, series Pixel comparison shootout coming soon. Now I have heard some people have had crazy issues with vibrating lenses, but this is not something I've personally experienced so I can't comment. But I did have a really strange problem with regards to camera and software, but I'll touch on that when I get to software in a minute. Oh, and subscribe if you're finding this video helpful so far, and I will love you for more than a minute. <laughs> So now onto the dynamic island, and I'm actually really torn. On one hand, I think it's ingenious. The animations when switching to Face ID or Google Maps, etc., is in true Apple fashion brilliant. So fluid, so exact, so reliable. And the little things like holding for more info on music apps, checking things like airdrop progress, do just make the overall experience of using the phone more enjoyable, more fun, more useful. But it does come with some drawbacks. Firstly, in sunlight, or just from certain angles, you can actually see where the two cutouts are for camera and sensors, and you can see where the display software is blacking out that section in the middle to elongate the pill, and it just looks in certain lighting a little messy. And I actually think whilst it wouldn't be symmetrical, I think I might prefer actually having that section in the middle not blacked out, just having the two cutouts so you have the screen in between just feeling more fluid it wouldn't be so aggressively cut into the display. Certainly less imposing when watching content. And on that note, I never thought I'd say it, but I think I actually prefer the notch in certain cases because when you're watching content any wider than 16 by nine, the pill actually now cuts further down into the display and cuts into that footage more than the notch. Touching up at the top to dynamically interact isn't the easiest either on a big phone and almost goes against the great work they've done bringing the notifications on iOS 16 down to the bottom. And the camera lens will at times be smudged due to fingerprints but that's a small point. Outside of that, the OLED display is on the whole fantastic, incredibly bright and vibrant, 2000 nits, amazing for use in direct sunlight, 120 hertz, wonderfully smooth in conjunction with the iOS 16 software and the animations as a whole, just a joy to use. Its LTPO tech can also change the refresh rate depending on what you're doing so that you can preserve battery by dropping it right down. And speaking of battery, there's been a lot of talk that the battery life is actually worse than the 13 Pro Max, mainly due to the always on display. So let's talk about that. Firstly, like with most Apple things, I've noticed as a consumer, you will either love their implementation of a feature or you will want to force the Android alternative is better. I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong, but the same can definitely be said with always on display. Android phones will have a completely black turned off screen on the whole unless you fully customize with just the tiny text and icons for your clock and notifications. Simple yet effective at reducing battery consumption. The new iPhones on the other hand have gone a different route where they basically just dim the current screen 
that you have on your home screen and draw away some of the color. So it's just kind of like a dimmed version. Probably like the look of it better than I do on Android, but definitely your battery won't thank you. Now, while not drastic, I have noticed battery being worse with it on than with it off, uh, but this will be lesser or worse of a problem depending on lesser or worse. It's the same thing, isn't it? Better or worse. <laughs> it will be better or worse depending on your individual usage. And battery life as a whole, especially with the always on off, is still been absolutely great. If battery is your main concern and you're jumping from any phone other than the 13 Pro Max, which probably is ever so slightly better, in my opinion, you're gonna have no problems whatsoever. Now, another feature that people have questioned the effect on battery life has been this eSIM controversy. Now, I'm in the UK, we have a physical SIM option. So this is not really a problem for me, but if you're in the US, it's eSIM only, which does have its pros, but also some cons, especially I know a lot of people that are looking to travel have a slight reservation over this move. I do think that eSIM is what most manufacturers are going to use as their future model. So it's something we are probably going to have to get used to. But thankfully, according to reports, it doesn't appear to have any effect on battery at all. Maybe not quite as scary as people first made out. I'll tell you what is scary though, the A16 Bionic chip's performance. Scarily bad. I'm joking, <laughs> it's just incredible. Not even a diehard android -iast. Android enthusiast, I've, I've just made it up, that is incredible. Android he asked. Not even someone who is completely Android could argue the fact that the chips that Apple are working with currently right now are on another planet. I can't think of a single use case for this smartphone where the chip is would ever be a problem. Gaming, social media, workflow, multitasking, you're never gonna be let down by its power. And it's only gonna be the software implementation which may make you want to choose something else because that's where the subjectivity comes in. Me included, while I've used both for obvious reasons, I've been Android for many, many years as my daily device with the SIM card in up until about three or four months ago when I switched to the iPhone 13 Pro Max long term. And I must say, whilst iOS still might not be someone's cup of tea, iOS 16 is just super slick. From the new customizable wallpapers and widgets to just the all round fluidity and snappy nature. But I did weirdly encounter one problem which I haven't ever experienced before. And I don't really know how to explain it, but uh, I'll try. So when I transferred over from my 13 Pro Max, the physical storage on both phones was quite low. So I decided to delete photos and videos that were being backed up to the iCloud. Before I started deleting, I wanted to create a fresh backup. So I went into the settings to start the ball rolling. Once that was going on in the background, I then dived into the photo gallery to sift through and have a look at some of the photos and videos I wanted to delete. I could have just deleted all of them, but sometimes I like having 17 options of where I want to get my content from. This is where things got a little bit strange. Once I dived into the gallery, gallery? Once I dived into the photo gallery, done that again. Once I dived into the photo gallery, I got a weird loading spin icon and the phone then jumped back to the lock screen. I tried to enable Face ID to get back into the phone. Face ID wasn't working. So I then swapped to using the pin code and that worked, I got back into the phone. But something still wasn't quite right. App icons had, in certain situations, blank faces, apps showing without the company image. So I decided to power off and on the phone. And this seemed to sort out that problem. The apps came back fine, Face ID was working fine, and I, I felt like I was good to go. But then I noticed when I was taking photos, when I was viewing them before taking the photo, everything appeared as it should, very sharp images, nice. But then when I went into the gallery to look at that photo, the focus was all off. Every photo was blurred. Very, very odd. Now, it's possible it was saving a lower quality file while the backup was going through or there was some kind of glitch around that. I don't know, but I've never experienced it before. And when I then was testing it again 10 minutes later, the problem went away. The gallery images were as sharp as they were through the viewfinder. But the weirdness didn't even stop there. I then went into the settings and it said I had a software update. I clicked on the software update and it said download new 16.0 update but I was already on 16.0. Uh, and sub point, about an hour later, I then got a pop-up for 16.0.1. 
But I definitely was told to install 16.0 again. I'm not really sure what happened there. Like I said, the issue didn't seem to last more than about 10 minutes. And I've never experienced anything like that on an iPhone before. But I thought I'd ought to share it because you might be interested to hear about it. Still no Type-C charging, which is disappointing, especially if you have a MacBook Pro, an iPad, etc., like I do and would love to be able to travel with just one cable. But another possible downside to Lightning and not Type-C is the lack of improvement to the speed of charging. It's not slow by any means and it's perfectly fine, but now you can get naught to 50% in 10 minutes, for example, on the Android side. Probably products in the next couple of months that are gonna be even quicker than that, whereas the iPhone is still stuck at around 50% in half an hour. Apple may argue this is to prolong battery health, while a lot of Android manufacturers would argue that you're not really gonna have a problem. That's up for you to decide. Stereo speakers, though, are amazing again, as expected. What Apple do with speakers and microphones in their devices currently, again, is industry leading. Plus, you have the standard IP68 water and dust resistant rating, wireless charging, and it's hard to argue overall that the new iPhone 14 Pro Max isn't one of, if not the most complete smartphone you can get your grubby little mitts on right now, if you have the cheddar. Now, if you want to protect your new iPhone from getting grubby or broken or scratched, then Pataka have some excellent iPhone 14 series cases. Today, I'm referring to the Mag EZ Case 3 range, and I have two of the five possible designs here. The black and gray twill, Aramid fiber, and the Fusion Weaving Rhapsody in both 6.1 inch and 6.7 inch sizes. All of them have this really stylish Aramid fiber look to them, and all can be used with wireless charging and MagSafe accessories, and all are ultra slim and lightweight while still providing decent protection for your phone. The Fusion ones are ever so slightly lighter and thinner and also have this really cool colored pattern strip on the left hand side. But I also really love this stealthy twill one. All the packaging is 100% biodegradable, which is really nice to see. And the chamfered edges mean that even with large phones, they can remain nice and comfortable in your hand with the raised camera ring, hopefully protecting your camera lenses from damage for years to come. Also available in black and blue twill and Fusion weaving overture if you wanted something different. All info can be found in the video description below with product links if you're keen. I have my Apple Watch Ultra and AirPods 2 videos dropping very, very soon. So make sure you subscribe to see those. Have you bought a new iPhone 14 series phone? Which color did you go for? Or are you diehard Android and wouldn't touch with a barge pole? I'll love you and leave you. I'll see you in the next one. Say it's BYT, peace out.